Hey, welcome to the Queens Connexus podcast. Uh, Queens Connexus uh, is a group of ministry leaders who are gathering together and collaborating together for the sake of seeing God's kingdom advanced here in Queens. Uh, today we have with us Lester, as always. Lester, how are you? Good. Well, you're getting better Good. and better at this intro stuff. Thanks, man. Yeah, you know, you. we've done this a time or two by now. <laughs> also, thank you, Lester. Also, we have with us is Judy Cha. Judy, Woo. welcome. Thank you so much for being on the pack, podcast with us today. Oh, wow. Thank you for having me. This is a real privilege. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you say it's a privilege. It's a privilege for us, um, seriously, uh, to be on the podcast. Uh, you just recently... Uh, a few months ago, your book, Who You Are, uh, Internalizing the Gospel to Find Your True Identity, came out. And um, uh, so we're grateful for just uh, you taking the time to put words on paper uh, and minister to the church in that way. Would you be willing just to tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and then uh, jump in and if you could just tell us about the book, summarize the book for us? Sure, sure. I'll start with uh, who I am. Uh as, as Jonathan mentioned, I am uh, Judy Cha, <laughs> Director of Redeemer Counseling Services, and I've had the privilege of serving there for 25 years. Wow. And uh, saying that out loud makes me feel a little older than I want to feel, oh. guys. <laughs> uh, but I have to say <clears throat> that it has been a real privilege, a rewarding journey for me, both professionally and personally. Um. Now, I, I grew up in a Christian home, but I became a real Christian when I was in college. And at that time, the field of psychology was not as open to acknowledging the spiritual aspect of people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted a biblical foundation in understanding people. So I went to Westminster Seminary, got my degree in counseling, then married a pastor and was in pastoral ministry for seven years before coming to Redeemer Counseling in 1998. Okay. Yep. And Redeemer Counseling, for those who are not aware of who we are, is a ministry of Redeemer Presbyterian Church. Um, and I would say that it's quite unique in that it is a fairly large professional counseling and training center that is housed within a church. We have 50 staff, wow. yeah, licensed and a few biblical counselors as well. And what we offer is direct counseling for sure, uh, but we also offer training to equip churches and also participate in research to engage the field of psychology. Awesome. So you said you came in 98, just out of curiosity. Uh, when was RCS started? 1990, so 33 years ago. So it was started early on in the Redeemer life. Yes. So what I've heard is after a year, after a year of the church opening, there were a lot of people coming in for pastoral care. Hmm. And Tim and the leadership decided that it would be good to have people who are specialized in caring for people. And so they started a counseling ministry mm. with just one counselor. But yeah. then soon that counselor was too busy and they needed to add more. So by the time I came, it was the director and his assistant and then about a handful of part-time counselors. But it's after 9-11, actually, mm -hmm. that we grew very, very quickly, not only in number of clients, but also number of um, counselors. So with that very fast-paced growth, it became very apparent to, to us who were there that we needed an approach that was going to unite us as a team and also represent us as a counseling ministry. And that's when Tim wrote his um, philosophy of counseling and purpose of counseling ministry. It's a, a few page white paper. And that was the start of uh, me and a few several counselors at wow. Redeemer Counseling getting busy defining our approach. Wow. And, uh, you know, two decades later, uh, mm. we are now sharing it yeah. in yeah. a book. It's so crazy because I feel like we are the, pr you're sitting in front of, 
the fruits of what you have done starting in the 90s because yeah. <laughs> Queen's Connexus has really benefited from RCS and even the SOSR, which you'll be talking about. But even for myself, um, you know, using it in this neighborhood in Queens has been really, really good. Like we've been implementing it in like youth programs here, like with non-Christian kids. Um, I don't know how to listen well. I, <laughs> I am, uh, you know, I'm just going to ask questions and like, you know, uh, tax people. But, you know, even in there, there's like connecting with people and say, oh, I wish I had this when I was younger, you know, learning how to connect better and validating. And, you know, I had no idea this was a thing. But anyway, thank you yeah. for yeah. doing. Yeah, I'm like, I love Judy and she's coming. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lester. Well, one of the even just in you answering that question, um, when I came and was introduced to RCS, it was large like it is now. And so I've never fully pictured it other than by namesake, a ministry of Redeemer. I knew it started out of that, but I didn't understand that it started as simple as one counselor, um, which is fascinating and interesting just from when, as a pastor myself, recognizing that I need help with counselors within ministry and then calling our people a few of our members who to get counseling degrees and help out with counseling in our church. Um, that was a novel idea to me. And honestly, I felt like I, as a pastor, was to some degree abdicating my responsibility as a pastor by putting counseling on other people in our church. Um, I don't know why I felt that way. Maybe because I grew up in a culture that didn't have a lot of counseling um, like what RCS is doing. And so to hear that that's actually how RCS got started has helped validate me and maybe for pastors and ministry to leaders listening, recognizing as pastors, you you have the ability to lean on the giftings and the resources of not only RCS, but other maybe trained counselors within your church body. Thoughts to that? Yeah, yeah. I definitely um, can relate to the pressure that pastors feel to shepherd their own people. Yeah. And I think to a degree you have to. You have to care for them. But also you need to know to what extent, because when it comes to counseling, it's not just what the person brings to you to work out, but it's also your capacity as the person giving care, right? And one of the key purposes that Tim Keller wrote about in his philosophy paper, he wanted a counseling ministry not only because there's people who are specialized and trained to do this work, but mainly because the, he wanted to steward the pastor's uh, time mm. and capacity because your role is to care for the whole. Mm. And sometimes these people who are in need of counseling are going to need a lot of your attention and for a long period of time. Yeah, uh, yeah. and so I say to uh, pastors... I feel for you because a lot is going to come your way, but please discern. You are you're not supposed to be caring uh, for everyone who comes to you to the extent that they need the care. That's good. That's so good. Yeah, because I feel like a lot of pastors and even just ministry leaders feel like there's an obligation of having to uh, do that as a responsibility, um, and then they feel that shame or guilt, and you know I didn't do enough. Or, yeah. There's so many people, but I think even part of Queens Connects is we're like, well, how do we train people to help pastors as well? You know, so it's not all just on pastors. But Yeah, uh, yeah. <clears throat> well, transitioning to your book a little bit, could you, in a couple minutes, um, summarize the main idea, the main ideas of the book, and then I've got some specific areas that I want to drill down in on. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So as I kind of alluded to, the book is really to introduce our uh, gift approach, gospel-centered integrative framework for therapy. Mm -hmm. You see why we use gift. Mm -hmm. It's a long name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, but uh, the premise of gift is that with every presenting issue that people come in to see a counselor, the core of the problem is the problem of identity. Okay. okay. But unfortunately, although the topic of identity has been a, a recurring theme ever, you know, as long as humans have existed. Uh, but I think you'll agree with me that the problem of identity has reached a new level of complexity today, right? 
Uh, and so I think the main problem is that people do not see the issue of identity as a spiritual issue. Okay. And what we're saying is we got to go back to the original design of humanity. And we were created to derive our identity, not within ourselves. That's the cultural message. But from outside of ourselves, from our creator. Yeah. And uh, something terrible happened when sin entered the world. We got disconnected from the very source from which we need to draw or derive our identity from, from God, right? Uh, and so now we are in this persistent, perpetual striving of looking for an identity. And uh, so uh, what I write, try to write in the book I divide it into three parts, and it's it was very easy to divide it up that way because this is how I think about when I see people as a counselor. What is the real problem, okay. and what can fix that problem, and then how do I help people find that solution? Right? Because I've learned that telling people does something, but it doesn't do enough. So I need to help them. So, uh, so uh, what is the real problem? Is that we are disconnected from God, and we try to save ourselves or find our identity on our own. And we, I believe the gospel is uh, the answer, right? Because it reconnects us to the very source from which we to derive our identity, and it could remove the barriers that keep us from really knowing who we are. Um, but the third part is, how do you then help them find this gospel and make it relevant and really transform their hearts? Yeah. That was the hard one. Um, and I, I write about it as it is a process. And maybe I will talk about it more as you yeah. ask me questions. Um, it is a process that requires uh, relational information not just head knowledge, but emotional, relational experiences with other people and with God. Mm. Yeah, And that's how we help people internalize the gospel further. Mm. In the beginning, part one, you talk about a system of self-redemption. Yes. And I, find, I found that to be one of the most like aha moments in reading your book. Not that that was something I had never heard before, but it was you presented in such a way that just put a lot of words and uh, and clarity to to something I see in, in ministry and people. So, can you explain self uh, system of self redemption and how that plays out in people's lives? Yeah, yeah, okay. So, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> why are you laughing? Why are you laughing? Because I love the system of self redemption. I could see the boxes in my head already. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You do too. Me too. <laughs> I'm like, where do I belong right now? Oh my where goodness. Where am I right now? <laughs> well, you know, what What uh, our faith tells us is that God had a plan to save us even before he created the universe, right? And it was through Christ. But when we separate, when sin separated us, what we do now is we rely on ourselves to save ourselves. And... Um, Self, system of self-redemption is a reflection of that self-reliance. Uh, but in the gift, what we try to do is capture the effect of sin. Okay, When sin into the world, what happened to us? Comprehensively. Okay, So I grew up in a uh, church all my life, right? And often I think people uh, think that why we struggle is like personal sin or spiritual weakness or woundedness or uh, spiritual warfare. It's not that they're not; these are not problems. They are, right? But it's very simplistic. And so I wanted to make something, not I, we, because this is representing collective wisdom of uh, Redeemer counselors. We wanted to capture, like I said, the effects of sin comprehensively. So we begin with shame, right? Shame is uh, the foundation of who we are. Because of our separation from God, we are all now born with 
internalized shame, the sense that something is wrong with us. It's not that we walk around with this with the weight of shame all the time, okay? But it is provoked very easily <laughs> as we live life, mm -hmm. okay? And it it becomes personalized. So sin affected us individual hearts that way. We are now born separated from God and internalizing uh, the sense that something is wrong, and that becomes the foundation of who we are. And this is why negative messages about us stick to us more firmly than the positive ones. Yeah. Um, but we also know sin didn't just affect the individual heart, right? It affected everything. So we experience traumas, we experience abuse, we experience losses, diseases, all these things uh, that I call core hurts. These are wounds. Um, that reinforce the internalized shame and personalizes it. So that sense of something wrong with me is now I am defective. I am worthless. Okay. Be as we are experiencing these core hurts that reinforce our shame. And it's in this context of pain that we develop strategies because God has given us agency. And actually it's a reflection of God's image, right? That we can do things to survive in this world. And uh, that's what we do. We develop strategies. But the, well, I wouldn't say bad things, but this is what happens when we develop strategies, just because we over, we are passed with the circumstances that caused us to develop that. We don't forego those strategies. Mm -hmm. It evolves. And it evolves into becoming part of who we are, and also a way to suppress our pain and also to assert uh, an identity that we think is worthy, mm -hmm. right? That's the strategy. Um, but the sad thing is these strategies, maybe it is not the sad thing because that's what actually gets people to come into counseling. <laughs> it's not effective, yeah. Right? Yeah. It fails. It yeah. fails in certain uh, situations. And then what it does is it triggers that emotion, accumulation of emotional pain that we have used our strategy to suppress. And then we react to that pain. And it's usually not in a very helpful way. In fact, it's often hurtful yeah. ways that we respond to that. So um, as I've mentioned now. So people, when they seek counseling, they come in because they are uh, experiencing circumstances that are very difficult. Or they're experience, they present, you know, feelings, emotions that are being triggered that's really hard for them. So I call them reactive emotions. Or behaviors that have gone out of control, like addictions. Okay. Um, but not everyone uh, knows that subconscious components of the SOSR is actually playing out internally for them. The shame, the core hurts, and the strategies. And so in counseling, what we try to do is, yes, we have to administer to those uh, aspects that they bring and say, this is my felt need, take care of it. Uh, it's like, feed me, I'm hungry. Yeah. So we do that. But <clears throat> then we want to engage them to look deeper and be free from those wounds and strategies that stand in the way, actually, from knowing their true identity in God. Yeah. So this is when I think about that uh, system of self-redemption, not only as a, a conversation piece, as something for pastors to think through as they're ministering to to people. But, and I don't want to throw this all out there, I'm not, it's not necessarily a question related with it, but, um, you know, how do you see this play out in pastors or ministry leaders, um, how do you see ministry, or do you see ministry oftentimes as um, manifestation of a minister's own self-redemption? Um, oh, absolutely. Do we see this often? Uh, oh. Yeah, talk to me about this a little bit. Yes, we do see it often, and it is so easy to make anything good, an ultimate thing hmm. that gives us a sense of identity, that makes us 
kind of forget our past wounds or suppress those past wounds. And sometimes we do that. Good things become ultimate things, you know. Those are Tim Keller's words. Yeah. Uh, and you're going to hear a lot of that yeah. out of my mouth. <laughs> I've been with him for 20 some yeah. years, right? We just give a uh, disclaimer that everything we say could probably be <laughs> quoted or referenced or cited towards yes, Keller. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, I sort of did the, in the acknowledgement yeah, of the book. Right. Um, yeah, so absolutely. I think that is the, um, not just ministry, but it could be like prayer. It could be what you know about scripture. Those are good things, but it could evolve and become something that you place, uh, you trust in to give you an identity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Lester, I know you and I just sitting around <clears throat> around coffee or whatever, just having conversations. Uh, you've seen some of this a little bit in your experiences in church and with ministry leaders of not necessarily narcissism, but where they ministers have made a good thing, an ultimate thing. Uh, do you have anything to add or thoughts to just how you see that play out and some a challenge you would give to ministry leaders? Yeah, I, I think I think one using this would be very helpful. <laughs> like this is this is one of the the, the models I'm like I memorize because yeah. what they've created here with uh, with Redeemer Counseling on Judy is like has been so it's been so cool and practical. Um, you know, so when we do see narcissist pastors or even, and listen, we all have a bit of that in us, right? Um, but it's, I think it's how we catch it. Uh, I think one, it's, I think personally, it's it's always having good covenantal friendships around you. Um, people that can challenge you. I, I want to say even like spouses are good, but sometimes I notice spouses are so afraid to say something that hurt their, you know, like their, you know, that they don't say too much. But a friend will be like, no, you suck. That was terrible. <laughs> and like, what's going on there? You know, and then SOS would be like, what are you actually feeling? <laughs> what was your past experience? What are you yeah. actually you know, experiencing now? Um, so I do feel like that's very helpful now. Um, I was actually going to ask you, Judy, like, how did you guys come up with this? Like, did you just sit around a kitchen table and drew out this map? Like, what happened? <laughs> oh, no, no, no. <coughs> you know, as uh, I've said, we spent almost two decades yeah. developing this. Um, gosh. <laughs> Initially, it started with Tim Keller's book, uh, Counterfeit Gods, oh, yeah. that really helped us to look at the strategy piece. Okay, And then he wrote the book uh, on suffering. I forget mm-hmm. the title now. But reading that made me go, ah, I know why strategies are so hard to relinquish. There's pain under there. Yeah. And we are trying to not feel that. Um, then we already knew that shame was part of it. It's just pieces, little pieces here and there. And actually, diagram was developed uh, initially by my husband. Uh, he is also a marriage and family therapist. Right. And... Uh, we had lots of conversation across the kitchen table going. This was the kitchen, kitchen table. Kitchen table. <laughs> yeah. It's always at the kitchen table. <laughs> Isn't it? Like we're eating something and somebody, oh, okay. <laughs> what do you think about that? That's so funny. Uh, and we were also studying, um, we were getting trained at Philadelphia Child Guidance Center in systems theory. <clears throat> and uh, we were just picking up little things here and there and how, uh, there's so much correlation between the view of self and other. And later I find out that there's correlation between uh, view of self, view of other, and view of God, right? So it's just little by little, yeah. God gave us more knowledge to consider and then add to uh, this this uh, book. And, you know, we finished the second draft of The Gift in 2016. Wow. And the idea of the book actually was floated then. Mm. But um, first of all, I was like, no, I don't want to write. <laughs> <laughs> I just finished my PhD dissertation. No, thank you. Um, <laughs> then, um, But then we also had an opportunity to do a research project with funding from John Templeton Foundation. And that research project was so interesting. It was really looking at 
um, how do you change? How do you how do you uh, facilitate change uh, in the heart? Right. So looking at the elements of repentance and faith, and really mm-hmm. looking, uh, codifying and identifying steps. How does this happen? So that took like four years to do wow. the research, but we I was able to add some of that in here. So it just yeah. built. That's so funny. Yeah. Starting from the kitchen table with yeah. your husband. That's yeah. amazing. <laughs> Yeah, Judy, I actually do have some, I mean, I'm sure Jonathan does too, but I want to jump into something. Yeah, about please. How, okay, I've noticed that when I went through the Fellows Program mm-hmm. and I learned about that SOSR, I was like, wow, this is something that people should know everywhere. <laughs> um, so, so then my thing was, how am I going to practice this? So then every time when I notice myself using the SOSR for, for me, not for other people, because I, I, think, I think when I'm using it for other people, I'm like, okay, I can actually draw this out like mentally but when it was for me it was actually really hard because i'm in my own conflict i'm in my own shame and it was really difficult to take myself out of it and then journal it down um i noticed that when i when i am in conflict with someone that's when i am like okay i need to really focus on my strategy and so my my thing is is power Mm-hmm. And I will always create strategy of power because I'm going to create something where I will always have resources and, you know, I will never be the last one to be left alone because <laughs> my past trauma, you know, yeah. so I'm thinking, okay, well, I understand how it's developed. And I love that part. Um, this is how I develop my power idol. Um, now, though, when I'm going through conflict, whether it is at, at, um, at my, my companies or whether my really close friends, I'm like, oh, Lester's. Lester, what is Lester doing? I'm like, okay, I'm going to cut this person out of my life and make sure that, you know, like they don't have access to this resource anymore. And there's, but I do that because I'm like, oh, it's, it's really my shame that's exercising my power idol. And, um, but what's really behind that is I don't want to feel alone. I don't want to feel stupid and foolish. You know, I don't want to feel forgotten. Mm-hmm. Um, that's helpful. But, okay, when someone is going through their own crap, <laughs> or they're probably like, like how would how do you what do you recommend them doing? Because you know everyone now out there is doing like self help stuff, right? Like some people don't have the resources or the money to go to counseling, and we are. I mean, we're in Queens, even in Elmhurst. Like for us to send people to counseling, we ha- our churches have to create a fund for yeah. that oh. to send them to counseling yeah. because one they might not have insurance or they don't have the money mm. to do so. If you were to give them advice when they're going through their own conflict and their own SOS star, like what would you teach them and what would you tell people to focus on? For me, it was really focusing on the strategy. And then we'll understand my, how I got there from my past experiences um, and then my cycle. But what would you focus on for someone who say, maybe they're sitting in the car right now and they're listening and they're having a fight with their spouse. And they, you know, what would you recommend them to do on that SOS or chart? Like, wh- what should they focus on? What questions should they ask themselves so this way they can kind of calm down and then reconcile those relationships? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Good. Lester, because you've been, like, engrossed <laughs> in yeah. the training and, and <laughs> everything, so it's easy for you to actually label what's going on, right? <clears throat> but the shame, the core hurts, and the strategy are actually operating subconsciously. So people don't know, right? don't experience that. I would say when you are reacting, okay, you're either reacting, you're reacting to pain. Right? So be curious is the first thing. Oh, I love that. Be curious. Don't judge. Okay. There's good reasons why you are reacting the way you are. Whether you are doing something or feeling something, be very curious about why is that happening. Okay. And sometimes you can do this yourself. I feel this way. I did this because I was thinking this and I felt that. Okay. Uh, however, I find that talking it out with people, it yeah. does not have to be a counselor. Okay. You putting it into words mm-hmm. helps you to unpack more. Yes. Yep. Okay. I love that. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you get stuck, and I'm like, I don't know, I keep doing this, and you keep talking to your friend, and it's not going, giving you more insight or uh, uh, change. Then I would consider like talking to someone who's trained 
who's going to be able right. to help you. That's so funny because if I spoke to someone that I know did not go through your training, mm-hmm. I immediately shut them out because I'm like, they're not going to practice validating, mirroring, or empathi- or sympathize, or empathizing. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, they're not going to practice those things, so I will not share those things. Mm-hmm. You know, so even just thinking about I haven't been through the training. You <laughs> cut me out. Do we need to put a wall you're, up right You're here? good. You're really good. You validate me. Even when I'm going through bad things, I'm like, that makes sense. I'm like, wow, Jonathan, I feel so validated and seen. <laughs> You know, so even sharing with people is, is it is important, yeah. but even like sharing with people who, who understands how to connect when your chapter connect with others, that's even better because some people would just start giving you advice, which I cannot stand. Yeah, I can't stand it. You know, and a lot of pastors who don't have this training, man, the worst, I don't want to share anything with you because mm-hmm. the second I tell you I'm going through something, you're going to start either praying for me, give me Bible <laughs> verses or give me advice. And I'm like, why am I coming to you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's really cool. I love that. You know, be curious about even what you're we think you through. should pray for people. Oh yes, but, I'm not saying that's not. I'm not saying that's not a good thing. <laughs> I'm but kidding. But you know, but like we, this is we, terrible. Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. it's just I, anyway. So I feel. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, <clears throat> I think those people uh, who do that is coming out of a good place, right? Mm-hmm. You you want to help, uh, and often I think people uh, when when they're thinking about helping, it's like fixing the problem. But really, you don't know what yeah. the problem is. Yeah. Uh, so don't make that your first goal to fix the problem. That's good. It is to sit and it's a relationship. Yeah. So, you know, just as, you know, our, our fundamental belief about our faith is a relationship with God. Relationship. Sit and get to know the person yeah. Yeah. and be curious and be attentive on and that empathetic. Point, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, no. but on that point, I just want to add, uh, you... Uh, <laughs> oh, my gosh. I, I earmarked so many pages. Look at that. Do you guys see this? <laughs> I earmark pages. I take notes. Uh, anyway, oh. <laughs> but you, you... It was just... Again, you said something um, that was just... Uh, it, it clarified and was like, yes. Uh, on page 17, you say, the most essential element in closing this gap is the corrective relational experiences Mm -hmm. that happen in human relationships. And I encourage people to go read to see what she means by gap there. But just the emphasis on how corrective relational experience and healthy relational experiences um, bring so much healing and is a means of grace in which gospel healing comes into people's lives uh, of a friend and relationships um, to where, yeah, you, you, you said it, even with... Hey, maybe the first step isn't necessarily having to go talk to a counselor, but just having a friend and having some of those healthy relational experiences uh, to be able to talk some of those things out and uh, go in preacher mode for a second uh, <laughs> to the person listening who uh, is a pastor or ministry leader. You need those relationships in your life. Right. You need uh, people where you can sit and they're going to listen to you and they're going to just understand. And, and then also um, there's just a, there's just the power as a pastor, as a ministry leader, to be that for someone else. To I think sometimes I feel the temptation as a pastor to always need to have the right mm-hmm. answer or always need to have the right Bible verse to give to people. Um, and sometimes I just need to remember that they just need me to listen and be there. My wife, some, I learned early on in marriage when my wife would share a problem, do you want me to fix this or do you just want me to listen? <laughs> um, and I had to learn that because yeah. I wanted to fix. And I think sometimes as friends and as ministry leaders, we just need to, to go, hey, maybe I just need to, I just need to talk. Yeah. And then uh, quickly, and then I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, <laughs> listeners, you've probably heard me say this many times, and you're going to hear me say it many times again. But that's precisely what Queens connects us in our relationship, friendship with Lester and others have been is in a place where I was uh, lonely Mm. in a place where I um, was hurt at, at, for various reasons, uh, friends just being there and uh, Lester and I grabbing dinner or beers or coffee and him just, and me being able to uh, process and him just being there and being a friend and others, um, has brought incredible healing. So when I read that on page 17 of your book, I was just like, oh my goodness. Like, I can't underline that enough. Me too. Oh my gosh, so did I. The Um, power (laughs) of relationship, right? Community, where there is vulnerability 
and where there is grace given. Mm. It's powerful. It is. It changes the way you see yourself and the way you see other people. And we know now that there is a correlation between how uh, we see other people and God. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just so sad, right, sometimes, because in the recent years, we've just heard so many significant faith leaders, mega churches, just yeah. not doing well. And that is going to affect how people uh, not only see us as Christians or That's churches, right. but also yeah. how they see God. That's right. Yeah. yeah. That's so good. And even using the language like, you know, having friends is something, un, you know, like unhealthy pastors will not understand you know yeah. so we really drive that point home here a lot i think even you using the words like corrective relational experiences for me as a single man like i'm going wow i don't need to be married to feel like my only a spouse can fix me yeah you know like not even god but like i need to go home to a, a spouse my wife or something to listen to me and fix me um you know but to hear that oh, i can have deep friendships um, I can find a like a Jonathan and David, you know, kind of a you know, relationship, and yeah. to have that correct my traumas. Um, I know it's not going to be, you know, the the perfect one. I know my relationship with God is first and, and foremost the most important uh, relationship, but to have that in a friendship is really hard to find, mm -hmm. and even not spoken about, mm -hmm. you know. So I I do really appreciate that you mentioned that. Yeah, Judy, I do want to ask you how. <laughs> How did you end up in this? Like, what happened to you? <laughs> like, Judy, tell me your, tell me your tea. Share Lister everything. Counseling the counselor. I want to know, because, okay, my thing is, I love this stuff so much. Yeah. Because one, you're right, it wasn't spoken about. Especially grew up in an immigrant household. Feelings is not something mm. we talk about. My parents are very, very abusive, you know, so to share mm. emo emotions or to even cry was something I would get beat for, oh. um, which in my friendship circle was very normal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, then I hear your stuff. I'm like, oh, this is not normal. I didn't know that. You know? Mm. Like, um, but I figured because of my past, I'm going, I want to share this with everyone. I'm going, Judy must have went through something. <laughs> you know, like what happened that you're like, this is something I really want to do and share with. And then you ended up marrying a, a, your, your husband, which is a pastor and a counselor. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what's going on here? <laughs> Tell me your past experience. Uh, okay, okay. You know, I get this question a lot, and I sort of write about yeah. it in the book. <clears throat> How did I get on this path? Yeah. And really, you know, my interest in counseling began with my own curiosity about me. All the stuff that I would think about, you know, the various feelings that I would feel, how I observed, like, I'm relating to people. And I wonder, what do I, why do I do what I do? Okay, so that curiosity was there, and then eventually it, it led to being curious about other people, mm -hmm. right? So I think that was sort of innately in me. Wow. And then um, when I came to the U.S. as an eight-year-old, you know, I could not speak the language. So, and back then, oh, see, this is dating me again. <laughs> it's okay. Way back then. <laughs> Asians don't reason. <laughs> <laughs> Judy, come on. <laughs> okay. Uh, they didn't have ESOL programs when when I was <clears throat> when I first came here. And so I was in the back of the classroom with a box of crayons mm. and uh, some sheets of paper making lots of observations about people. Oh my gosh. How old were you? 8 years old. <laughs> But remember, I'm curious about me. And so I'm like watching people yeah. going, oh, why did they do what they do? And why did that person <clears throat> do that? So anyway, all this curiosity uh, led me to kind of want to know more. And as I said, I became a Christian, a real Christian in college. And uh, at first I thought I was going to be a doctor. Mm -hmm. That's what my dad wanted me to be. But I just couldn't do biology, guys. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, Me <laughs> either. <laughs> so, so, you know, I switched over to psychology. And the plan was that I was going to get my biblical foundation and then I will become a psychologist. Didn't know I was going to marry a pastor. 
<laughs> okay, so after that, uh, I told you that we were in ministry for seven years. And there was, and so we were just gung-ho about ministry. Mm-hmm. Maybe it was an idol, right? Uh, we lived separate, like, he went to school and I was in Connecticut. He was in Massachusetts. So we did that weekend couple thing. I, we sacrificed so much wow. to minister to our congregation. Mm-hmm. Um, then we got called to New York. And I did not want to come to New York. Lester, I'm not a city girl. <laughs> you know, I'm quiet. I like peace. <laughs> and uh, But... My husband said, you know, God's calling us to go. So we w- we came here and two years. So my husband then got very sick with a mysterious sickness. Mm, wow. Like soon after he started in New York. Oh, my gosh. I know. I was like, what is going on? And um, then, but he couldn't, we, we couldn't figure out what it is. He, he lost a lot of weight. And he couldn't function as well as he Mm. wanted to in this new church. Uh, But then he was recovering and he was doing more and more. But two years later, the church actually let us go. Mm. And this was the same pastor who called us to Connecticut and who was a mentor for us. And we pretty much trusted his guidance. And that's why I said, okay, we'll go to New York. (laughs) <laughs> and then he lets us go. Oh. And he did it in such a way that it was so, we couldn't make sense of it. Hmm. Sounds so unrelational. I'm so sorry. Uh, yeah. It, it was just announced. It was sort of like you don't fit the vision. And uh, then it was announced that very Sunday. And we were like, oh, oh my goodness. This is our last day. And we didn't know. Oh, my oh. gosh. Um, yeah. And so this community that we thought was our family for two years and this is what we do we open our house like just like you (laughs) and had people over all the time in the midst of like some mysterious mysterious disease yeah sure sure. oh because that's how we thought we do ministry that's how you do it um yeah and so after that we went through obviously some disorientation about okay, are we supposed to be in ministry? What are we supposed to do with our lives? And Redeemer was a place where we're going to go just until God makes it clear to Mm -hmm. us. And then um, I remember the first sermon that uh, I heard at Redeemer. I don't even remember the passage, but the phrase was, is Christ enough? Hmm. You know, And that really sat with me yeah. is Christ enough um, and so we said okay we can't just forego ministry let's sit and wait and uh, see where he calls us so then I that's why I got a job at the counseling center um, because we needed to pay bills it wasn't because yeah. I wanted to be a counselor right. and it was in Manhattan <laughs> yeah exactly I want to go back to Maryland where there's lots of grass <laughs> well, no such thing here. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is that, so crazy. That journey is a crazy journey. And mm-hmm. quick side note: pastors don't do what their pastor did. Uh, don't yeah. do that. Um, right. Despite <clears throat> the crazy journey, um, I'm personally grateful for your ministry, yeah. and I'm grateful and really looking forward to having you back after your next book. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that one? <laughs> oh, you know, that's I'm so kidding. funny. I'm kidding. <laughs> is, is, there, is there another one coming? Oh, man. I was hoping no, I was no, no. shooting my shot with that one. I know. I was like, oh, my gosh, oh, there's yes. another one. No, no, no. Remember I said it took 20 years to get this content? Well, guess what? I poured out everything I know. There's nothing more. Who you are. Next one's who you is. <laughs> who you is. <laughs> the Queen's version. The Queen's version. <laughs> Judy, how do you and your husband have conflict? I can't imagine this. Two counselors. Like, how do, do you guys have conflict and then you counsel each other? <laughs> I would die if someone tried to counsel me yeah. while is, I'm having conflict with them. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. Like, are you trying to counsel me? Stop yeah. doing that. <laughs> yeah. My, my dad, quickly, my dad had a master's in counseling. And so oh when my, my brother goodness. and I would fight, he would do the whole counseling thing. And I'd and just, just be like, no, yeah. you just tell him he's wrong. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't try to just tell him. And he's like, you no, know when it's coming. Yeah, right. Yeah. Exactly. So I guess, yeah. so yeah, that's, that's a great question. That's how it is. No, no, no. We name it. So you are feeling that reactive emotion. <gasps> that doesn't offend you when someone does that? Oh, yeah, of course it oh does. Oh my gosh, but, I would die. But, I would flip tables. <laughs> But we know escalation isn't going to help. So right. we go, okay, we're both in a reactive state. Sometimes we just break out laughing because like, <laughs> that's what's being triggered. We're like, ah, never mind. You know? That is so funny. Yeah. I'm going to try that as somebody. I know what you're feeling. <laughs> <laughs> you just leave. That's See, a reactive emotion right there. <laughs> okay, well, this is a reactive emotion too. <laughs> that is so I'm funny. Here. Try that on me, Lester. We'll see what I, happens. I can't. I don't know. I would die yeah. if someone did that to me. <laughs> Your core, core hurt is being triggered. Right yeah. Now. Right. Yeah. Sorry. Those are my silly questions. I'm like, I need to no, know no, what happens good. when Judy and her husband fights. <laughs> Oh, my gosh. Well, Judy, uh, we are incredibly, again, grateful for you, grateful for your ministry, grateful for your willingness uh, to take the wisdom and experience and put on page. It's a benefit um, uh, to my ministry. It's a benefit to many, many other uh, Christians as well. And so uh, we just want to say thank you uh, for that. And we want to encourage you listeners to go and grab Judy's book, um, and uh, take it and read it twice at least. <laughs> read it once. Just <clears throat> if you're a ministry leader, just read it without your ministry leader hat on. Just read it as a Christian, uh, allowing it to be a mirror, allow it to be a reflection, allow it to push you to Christ and to recognize yeah. that in Christ and Christ alone can carry the burden of your identity yeah. and where your heart will be fulfilled. And then start back at the beginning and read it from the perspective as a ministry leader and go, how can I then take and encourage the gospel and these skills and these uh, frameworks um, to minister uh, to leaders? And then lastly, just want to say, be humble enough to go. um, You can't counsel everybody nor should you, and and be willing to lean on other people's giftings in that. And uh, if we can say, Tim Keller did it, so you can too, and you should too, <laughs> and lean on other other people's leaders, uh, leadership giftings in, in the counseling endeavor. So, yeah. I think even for, even for me, I think there are three things that I really enjoyed doing as an advocate of what Judy and her organization is doing is one, I'm already starting a book club with this yes. because I think this is important to talk about. Mm. Um, and if you don't understand it well, it's okay because um, they also offer fellows program, and they also offer like these these um, these you can hire people to come and do workshops. Mm. I love that, you know. So I think having that first and then reading this book has been really really good. Um, and lastly, I think uh, the third thing would uh, would be obviously finances. If there's uh, any kind of like, you know, funds that you can donate towards them, what they do is amazing. I think personally for me in Queens, again, we don't we don't talk about emotions here in Queens because we know that the neighborhood here is very immigrant centric. Mm-hmm. Um, we have to send people to mm-hmm. the city, you know, so to have them to have Redeemer Counseling come to Queens was so, so rare for us. Uh, we just don't have those resources here, you know, so you can have them go to your church uh, train pastors if you want. We did that for yeah. our cohort where it was 40 yep. like church planters and old pastors. And they sent like eight or nine counselors to come and just like, yeah. you know, do one-on-ones with our with our group. And it was amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, just learning about their own traumas and then teaching them what to do with that, even with their with their congregants. Um, Judy, I wanted to ask you, what do you think you would tell, I guess, the pastors that we work with you know, we do work a lot with, we're in Queens and Queens mm-hmm. Connects. So like uh, we do have a, I feel it might be a little bit different of a demographic here because a lot of people here are, are immigrant, um, you know, families and how we're raised. Um, what would you, I guess, what would you say or what, what advice would you give them in ministry um, that maybe you have noticed um, that you want to maybe prep them for? Because I, I know Satan is always attacking our people here, you know, so uh, what, what what would you say to them to prepare them for ministry here in Queens? Mm. I know there's a lot, but <laughs> well, the 
know that we are all born broken, right? People are looking for safe spaces, looking for what we lost in Eden, mm. you know, where we can be fully naked mm -hmm. and not ashamed. And uh, I think this, not just Queens, but everywhere, it's yeah. like, lead with that. You know, I think sometimes we want to take biblical truth, and that is very important, good preaching, but uh, lead with this position of wanting to know and being curious and being attentive to where people are, who they are, right? So get to know who they are. Yeah, yeah that's the good. Curious, yeah. yeah, the curiosity that you mentioned over yeah. and over again. Yeah. My gosh, even the, the tone of your voice, everything just makes me want to cry. <laughs> <laughs> this is as loud as she gets everyone, so... <laughs> It's so calm. Yeah. I'm like, wow. <laughs> oh, yeah. Goodness. Well, yeah. uh, let's close there on this idea. And I want for those listening with Queens Connexus to know, like, that's one of the reasons why we exist is we want to be a fellowship, a safe place of relationships. And so if you're a ministry leader and you're looking to go, you know what, I, I, I need to lock arms with other ministry leaders. I need safe places. I need relationship. I need friendship just to be able to continue for other people to understand where I'm at and what I'm going through. We want to invite you to join us every Wednesday. We have a, a devotional group of ministry leaders that gather at 930. You can find out more information at queensconnexus.org. We would encourage you to do so and come join us sometime. And we thank you for your ministry in Queens. And then just lastly, again, in closing, Judy, thank you so much. Ooh. We are grateful for you and for your ministry and blessings to you. Uh, thank you for being with us today. Oh, thank you for having me. This has been a real pleasure, really. You're, you're going to have to sign my book, by the way. <laughs> <laughs>